Okay, we're live here at VMworld. I'm John Furrier at SiliconANGLE.TV. This is VMworld exclusive coverage, and my next guest is Ping Lee from Excel Partners, venture capitalist, number one venture capitalist uh, in the world on big data, top 10 in the, in the business, recently by Forbes. Congratulations, CUBE alumni, welcome back. Thanks, John. I'm calling Frank Artali, who you just said is available, so we're going to try to get him on the CUBE. Uh, he's not going to come on, but hopefully we'll, we'll get Frank Artali, who said he might be available um, on the CUBE. But, um, well, we went, to, went, went into voicemail. Uh, Frank Artali, you missed your opportunity. So Ping, welcome back. Uh, good to so, be back. So excel has got a little party tonight. You guys yeah. have a little reception for entrepreneurs. You're out scouring the landscape for deals. Um, um, so first question is, what's new with you? Tell us a quick update on what's happening with Excel and yourself. Sure, so uh, the update on Excel is pretty straightforward. I think we continue to be very excited about a lot of the trends we're seeing in the technology landscape these days. I think the, the move towards uh, software-enabled infrastructure is, is uh, accelerating. Uh, I think the commoditization of hardware, CPU cycles, storage, et cetera, is driving the value to the software layer. So we're seeing this across compute, storage, and networking. Um, Big data is one of the vectors we continue to invest alongside in the application ecosystem around that. But we think there's uh, building blocks throughout the data center that are getting transformed by startups every day. So you're also on the board of Cloudera. Any new investments you want to share with the, with, with the audience uh, and update on current investments and new investments, anything new? Sure, I mean, I think we've done a lot of stuff um, in, uh, in, in both security as well as uh, that are going to be announced and, and some more new big data applications that are not quite yet public, but they're basically applications that are right on top of the new data platforms like Hadoop and NoSQL that allow business users to extract value out of those data platforms. So a lot of the areas that we're focusing on these days is not just the uh, underlying infrastructure, but also the applications that, uh, that business users can, can interface with. So the question on big data, I have to ask you, is it frothy out there? It still seems to be very frothy in terms of investments. A lot of things seem to have slapped on the big data washing is hitting the scene. So when you, when you see that, you know, it's getting hot in terms of a sector. I mean, obviously you guys have a fund wrapped around, you got some dedicated dollars to it. You're close to it with Cloudera, among other investments. Um, talk about the impact of what's happening with big data. Obviously it is, it is hot, um, but it's applying to a lot of different verticals. Are you, are you seeing more diversity? Are you seeing some consistency in the kinds of startups, the kind of applications? I think there's a, a growing amount of diversity. I, and I'm, I've been pretty encouraged. I know there's a lot of hype around big data uh, and there's a lot of enthusiasm. But I think what's interesting is there's a lot of adoption too. Uh, if you look across verticals, I don't think there's a single vertical that's spared from the, uh, the, the technology around big data and how they can leverage it to, to generate more value. So I think if you look at all the different you know, Hadoop companies, they all seem to be getting real customers, meaningful deployments. I think we're moving from the hey, what is this thing to now, how do we get value out of it? So we're seeing real production deployments, um, and now I think we're seeing uh, you know, real use cases get built around it across verticals. Excel's been a great investor, obviously. You guys have a lot of successes under your belt as a firm uh, with big data. Obviously, you're active in that. Um, one area that's hot right now that you guys have had always had a great perspective on was infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, converged infrastructure is has been around for a while. It's been a name that's been the, the holy grail, you know, storage, networking, and right. compute converging together. That's great, and I think, I mean, I first heard the term many, many years ago, uh, but it's actually happening now except the new dynamic around data. So one of the things that we've been talking about this week, Ping, and I want to get your perspective on this, is what Dave and Vellante and I are talking about called data infrastructure. Kind of converged infrastructure, but modernized with the impact of the role of data at the infrastructure layer, enabling new data on top of it, new data applications, mobility, because obviously when you talk about big data, analytics, you've got mobile, you have a lot of new apps leveraging data, whether it's program apps or other apps. So big data to me kind of now talks about the top of the stack, right. stuff's happening. Um, underneath that, SSDs, the infrastructure's changing, you've got caching layers, Fusion IO, we had David Flynn on again, Cube alumni, you know, obviously violin's hot, flashes everywhere, we had pure storage on Scott, he was awesome. So, Flash and the role of data and storage has been a big part of this new infrastructure configuration changes. What's your view on data infrastructure? Can you share how you see this modern, the modernization of converged infrastructure? Um, do you see it? Can you talk about that? I mean, obviously converged infrastructure is great, we love it, there's some efficiencies there, but it's kind of evolutionary, but it's not a breakout change. So what's breaking out around the infrastructure around data? I actually think it is it is pretty game changing what is going on on the storage layer. If you look at what Fusion IO has done, what companies like Nimble Storage have done, they basically inserted a whole new tier of storage called SSDs Flash that didn't exist before. 
if you, if you look back in time, when's the last time a new tier of storage uh, has, has come about? Right? I mean, there's been, there's been RAM memory, there's been disk, there's been tape. Uh, now there's a whole new uh, layer of technology that really is changing the price performance ratio. Uh, and I think that has yielded the a possibility to have a whole new set of applications that, that can come on top of it, right? And I think one of the things that I'm excited to see is a lot of the cloud applications that are starting to emerge, whether they're internet data centers, et cetera, are assuming uh, high performance but at low cost points. Uh, and I think the new storage infrastructure is emerging so that it can meet those needs, uh, can be truly scale out and truly elastic so you can add storage resources on demand as opposed to having a very um, siloed scale up architecture of the past. And I think that kind of elasticity is driving uh, a tremendous amount of innovation, not just at the storage layer, but also the applications on top. Um, I want to ask you a question. We asked Pat Gelsinger, and, and he talked about this on, on one of our previous CUBE interviews around you know, what, how to stay relevant in, in, in new technology. And, in, and he's got the classic line, if you're not out in, in front of that next wave, you're going to be driftwood. Uh, and you guys deal, deal with this every day as investors. You got to read the tea leaves, you got to talk to the young entrepreneurs, connect the dots and make good investments, that's your business, right? So uh, that requires essentially having an internal team, which you guys have. But the other two elements are university access and access to startups. So you see in deal flow, so Mike Alton and I talk about this all the time about how systems, the systems guys and the operating systems kind of mindset has been shaping the big data world. What are you seeing in, at the university level and, and, how, and what's trickling into startups around new emerging uh, tech and mindset that's kind of changing the game on the infrastructure and the big data side? I think it's, uh, it's a more than a big data thing. I think historically what you've seen is anytime there's new platforms that, that get created, there's uh, a sea change of innovation that follows, right? And I think uh, what VMware has done with virtualization is a fundamental platform that you know, cloud computing has been built off of. And then there's incredible startups that, and innovation and entrepreneurs that flock to that platform to deliver new applications and, and change how things were done previously. I think mobile, you're seeing the same thing, whether it's iOS or Android. These are new platforms that are ushering a whole new set of applications and new ways of doing things that couldn't be done before. So you know, what we look for is kind of platforms that can potentially change uh, past paradigms, and then usually there's a lot of derivative or uh, ancillary companies that get created around that, right? And I think uh, Hadoop is an example of the one in big data, right? That's a fundamentally new platform that uh, a lot of an ecosystem can get built around. Um, I think we're in a very unique time uh, in the data center where there's so many new platforms getting proliferated. Um, and that's why there's so much innovation and startup activity these days. Let me ask you a question that's maybe a little bit more kind of a step back, watch the trees and wind blow and the trees sway. Um, we had a conversation last week on SiliconANGLE around how the Hadoop error is different than the Linux error. Uh, and I'm on record as saying, just so I'll put my bias out there, that the Linux error is not the same as the Hadoop error, uh, mainly because in the Linux error, um, I know Benchmark might feel differently, but um, the Linux error had one, one big guy with a billion dollars trying to kill it, and that's Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see anyone with a billion dollars trying to kill Hadoop. Mm -hmm. So, so that's kind of like my main core thesis, but really it's different now. Hadoop is really much more of a multifaceted uh, architecture. So the, so the question is, what do you see in this Hadoop error that you can share with folks that, that, that points to, not so much against the Linux argument, but that makes it different? Um, because it is, there is breakout tech going yeah. on right now. It's, it's more disruptive, less evolutionary, more, more um, revolutionary. What do you see now in this Hadoop era, or this modern era of infrastructure that's different that you can point to and say, that's, because of this, it's not the same as the old days? I think the biggest difference is, if you look at Linux and, and some of the other kind of open source platforms, they were commoditization plays. It was very much saying, hey, I don't no longer want to buy expensive proprietary operating systems from Sun Solaris or, or, uh, or Windows, and I think Hadoop is not that. We're, the goal of Hadoop is not to commoditize the relational database. MySQL already did that, frankly, right? Uh, Hadoop is about value creation, and it's about looking for new applications that couldn't be processed before. So it's about focusing on unstructured data, not structured data. It's not about trying to move SAP legacy workloads onto a new data platform. It's about enabling new applications to, to operate on a new data platform. So I think it's, it's actually quite different, as, as you know. I think one is about commoditization, one is about value creation, and I think uh, the opportunities around value creation are, are, uh, are, I think, are bigger, frankly, and I think it's, that's how you build a, a unique ecosystem around it. Well, I just got confirmation that Frank Artali is on his way, legendary investor for Ignition Partners, who's been on theCUBE before. He's going to come on. I know you mentioned you guys just talked. Oh, he's here, he's in the house. Uh, we're here at Ping Lee uh, with Excel Partners. Um, 
What's on the radar for you guys as a firm? Um, obviously, you invested in Facebook, had a great return there, um, and quite frankly, Facebook saved many funds <laughs> besides, like, well, you guys didn't weren't saved, but other funds had made some good dough on Facebook um, that were you know, kind of hanging around. Um, the question is more about the current state of investment in, in Silicon Valley and beyond. Obviously, there's big talk about transparency in the VC community. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz has been pretty disruptive in terms of how they're investing. How has the VC landscape changed, and is it different in terms of going after these new territories like big data and data infrastructure? I don't think, I don't think it's changed. The VC industry itself hasn't changed. I think it's always about finding the unique entrepreneurs. I think, I think what's different uh, in the last couple of years has been, um, you know, there's been a lot more emphasis around software and enterprise uh, companies. It's an area that Excel has been done a lot in the past and cont uh, are excited about going forward. So I think a lot of the, you know, the Facebook, LinkedIn, Zingas of the world ushered a whole new wave of consumer applications. And I think those consumer applications are having an impact on what enterprises want, right? Enterprise users want the same type of experience um, on the consumers uh, within the office, right? And I think that's driving a whole new change in uh, enterprise infrastructure as well. So I think it's it's a, it's a, it's a it's a really impactful change that the consumer side's had on the enterprise, and I think that's an area that we're very focused on. Um, let's talk about Cloudera, one of my favorite companies. Obviously, I have a um, close bias to those guys. I know known Amr and uh, Mike Olson over there as part of that Cloudera Labs. They were a first mover in the market. Um, can you talk about the dynamic thing? I know you sit on the board, so you may or may not want to share confidential information, but just kind of a general perspective. Cloudera as a first mover really kind of created the category. Amr Awadala saw the future, created the company. You guys financed them, and a lot of people jumped in as well. Um, how are they doing, and what do they need to do to continue to be successful? They've taken a pretty straightforward approach, continue to lead the market with putting out great code and leading the market. But if that red hat of Linux is not going to happen as it did with Linux, what do they need to do to be successful to go to the next level and ultimately move forward? I think there's plenty of work to do to be, uh, to take a do from where it was uh, when Doug Cutting started years ago to an enterprise, enterprise grade data platform. Um, there's a tremendous amount of management features, governance features, security features, all that stuff that you need to have in order to operate uh, a data platform, right? And I think there's plenty of work to be done on that. I also think there's a lot of opportunities around creating an ecosystem around it, so providing a platform that is rich enough for ISVs and developers to build interesting applications on top um, to really extract the value from the platform to the business user, right? So I think uh, those are all areas that uh, the company is, is excited about. We just and, had and Frank Slubin on, who is an industry legend in terms of sure. operational successes, and I asked him, Frank, what's your strategy for scaling an operation? He said, growth. Right, so obviously Cloudera is doing really well. Any update on Cloudera in terms of growth? Obviously, that's their focus. You, are you agreeing with that? That's continuing to be their focus is to grow fast, and and yeah, I think I the think the, the, what's exciting is the market is growing fast. So I think they have an opportunity to uh, grow along with the market and hopefully lead it. So I think uh, it's it's a market where I think if you're not growing, you're going to be left behind. Okay, I want to welcome uh, our new guest who just jumped in, Frank Artali. This is real-time communications with text messaging. <laughs> yeah. uh, Frank Artali, welcome back to theCUBE. Glad to be here. Frank Artali is a CUBE alumni, also a venture partner at Ignition Partners. They, they, they make big bets, they spend a lot of dough, do big rounds. Also, you're an angel investor, you've done some angel work, you've invested in Cloudera, and you do some seed deals at Ignition, um, just to kind of keep the action going. Um, question for you, what do you think, what's going on in this marketplace today? Obviously, VMware's are scaling up, IT's hot again, I, mean, I think we called that uh, last year. Yeah, pretty, we did. Pretty easy. What's happening? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, IT is is cool again. I mean, just uh, just witness the amount of people uh, that are here at the show. Uh, anytime you can you can fill Moscone, uh, it's usually a good indicator uh, in terms of people's willingness to spend their time uh, and also their money to come and learn things. And and I think uh, if you look at you know the, even the keynotes from yesterday, you know, the transition from what to how, uh, and that was something that I talked about last year as well. But but now a completely new uh, infrastructure has come into place, and to me it feels like. It's the, it's the early 1990s again when the changeover from mainframe to mini computer went over to, went over to client server. Now everyone is trying to figure out how do, I get, how do I get my applications and all my infrastructure that's on client server on premises today, how do I get that into a cloud format, being it public, private, or, or hybrid? I think and it's, it's happening. And I think it's interesting to see all the new workloads that virtualization is now 
eating into or being able to support. And I think in the past there was test dev and then maybe some production. Now it's beyond just production, but new applications, right? So I think it's up and down the stack. Up I mean, and you, down got, the stack. you got low level virtual machines, some, some uh, anyone who's got the big server farms, commodity farms are all looking at some of the cutting edge work coming out of University of Illinois uh, around low level virtual machines is hot all the way up to the top where you have you know, VMs spanning across data. So obviously virtualization's hot. Um, the question I have for you guys, and I'll start with Frank, because he's got a good view about Microsoft. Uh, Pat Gelsinger's out here now, the CEO. We had him on theCUBE officially this morning as the first time as a CEO of VMware. Um, he's got to be the peacemaker now. He's not just EMC anymore. The VM, and VMware is looking beyond VMware now. They're looking at an ecosystem. You got Hyper-V, you have other hypervisors out there. So they got to start, start expanding out this ecosystem. So at the same time, companies like Microsoft are adopting Hadoop. And we're seeing open source not be that renegade replacement, beat the incumbent. We're seeing incumbents adopt open source, and Hadoop in particular, as a, as a business model, not just as a you know, R&D thing. So question for you is, um, multi-vendor, interoperability, and what is Microsoft doing? What's your, what's your take on Microsoft relative to all this? Because you know, they've got a big stake in, in the game here. Right, so I think look, for when VMware says multi-cloud, I mean, let's, be, let's be clear, just like you know, VMware has always been uh, been multi-infrastructure, so you didn't say, oh, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy ESX and only, I can only run it on Dell, as an example. So as, again, so as VMware moves up stack, like it was, it was, it was depicted you know, in the keynotes of, of yesterday and today, uh, you can clearly see that the customers will require a choice. If a customer has a cloud that's not a VMware cloud, VMware does need to embrace that, just like in, when the hallmark of VMware in the past has always been embracing uh, server infrastructure uh, of, uh, of choice. Uh, you know, Microsoft, my previous employer of 10 years, you know, on, you know, on the other hand, has, has always been a company that, uh, that's lived by embracing choice on things like, like server, uh, and also on interfaces. Now the question I think that'll be, that'll be harder for Microsoft, since it does have its own cloud property, you know, can it really go and embrace you know, other clouds in the way an, an independent vendor like VMware can? So I think it'll be a challenge for them. So, I want to ask you, I have to ask you, because obviously it was a big brouhaha in the blogosphere and SiliconANGLE covered it. Uh, my commentary on it was pretty much, yeah, it's kind of accurate, but really unfair on Microsoft. So Vanity Fair wrote a really negative article on Microsoft calling it 10 wasted years. Um, really chronicalizing all their failures and stacking them up uh, as a total colossal failure. They've had a lot of other successes, so can you comment on that and what your opinion is on, on one, the article and around Microsoft as a whole over the past 10 years and kind of how they're positioned going forward today? Yeah. Well, like, interestingly enough, I, I left Microsoft 12 years ago, so it was 10 <laughs> years that I wasn't there. They started so. failing when you left, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's true then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the things that, that really happened, let's, let's call it at the tail end of the 90s and in, into, uh, into the decade of 2000, again, the quote unquote lost, lost decade in IT, is that uh, a lot of the, the venture investing, a lot of smart money was going into uh, investing in the things that are powering the big uh, e-commerce and big consumer websites today. So if you look at you know, the things that have come out of places like Facebook and Yahoo, in particular, uh, you know, technologies like Hadoop, but also techniques for managing storage, techniques for managing servers. A lot of that investment was done in the, uh, in the way of, uh, of facing consumer properties. And in, in the first half of the 2000 decade, it really still was about deployment. And I think in, in the end of the 90s, deployment in enterprises. We, we, we made an expectation as insiders that everything was done, but there was just still an awful lot of work to be done on inertia and momentum to get things done. And so we didn't see the smart money really swing, swing back into enterprise until the last, uh, last couple of years. And I remember, you know, I was a, an inventor development at Axel when, when Ping came on as a general partner. And sometimes he and I would be looking at each other like, you know, we're the only ones crazy enough to do enterprise stuff. Because uh, no, no one was really, no one was really interested. And you know, and to an extent, I think it was, uh, uh, if you want to you know, point to a, a, lost de a lost decade for Microsoft, I'd, I'd, I'd say it's a lost decade for you know, enterprise IT in general. And so I think it's more of a, an industry-wide thing than Microsoft only. Ping, I know your thoughts there. Oh, which is, I think that's why the, the enterprise startups are getting so much traction these days. There's been such a scarcity of innovation for a long period of time, not just from Microsoft, I think from a lot of the incumbents. If you look at what's happened in the last five years, the incumbents have consolidated, not innovated, right? And I think that creates a tremendous opportunity for startups that, uh, whether it be compute, storage network, or the application side of the data layer, I think uh, we're excited about all, all the different pockets. Okay, I want to ask you guys real quick what you're investing in. Frankie just joined, so tell us, what are you investing in right now, and what are the hot deals you're doing? So, you know, again, I invest in, in the things that I know primarily, and that is uh, data center infrastructure and solutions. 
And so I still think there's plenty of work to be done uh, on security uh, and networking, networking at the management and policy governance level. Uh, hybrid cloud to me is very interesting, uh, especially as uh, businesses of all sizes want to move their applications into that format. Uh, so those things that I find particularly interesting. Well, we had Bromium on, by the way. Uh, Simon snuck in. We oh, that's snuck great. Oh, we we snuck Simon in. He was actually sanctioned to actually walk the hallways here at VMworld. Yeah. <laughs> Ping, what are you investing uh, in? I think if, I, I agree with uh, Frank. I think the, the networking layer is finally starting to get turned over as um, the hardware becomes commoditized and the value becomes in the software. So I think a lot of the areas around networking is interesting. I think uh, we talked about it earlier, but I'm, I'm seeing a lot, but not enough uh, applications of big data, uh, and less about and the, what the particular, data. how would you filter those deals? So for the folks watching, obviously, well, I mean, everyone's working on some stuff. Describe the, the kind of deal you'd love to see. Yeah, I'd love to see uh, companies that are, whether it's data visualization, business intelligence, uh, data analytics, you know, companies that are building data products on top of the next generation data platforms that can actually get a business user to get value, right? Uh, I think right now it's very focused at uh, the data guy as opposed to the business guy. And how do you marry, the, the, you know, how do you bridge that gap I think is, and there's, you know, there's a lot of startups doing it. I think there, there could be more areas of innovation. Um, so I want to kind of go on a kind of an abstract questioning here for you guys. So I want to get your insight, because you see a lot of the emerging deals, but you also have a vision, a vision for the future, and you got to kind of read the tea leaves as VCs. So uh, we were talking to uh, uh, Dell yesterday, Tarkin Maynard, who sold, sold Wise to Dell, and he's trying to wrap services around. So, oh, IT computing, is, it's a huge market. Okay, but you look at the success of Apple, um, single digit hardware market share, massive profits, the most valuable company in the world. And I was kind of saying, can you imagine if Apple hits 20% market share of overall hardware, kind of what that financial picture might look like given their current business model. Okay, so we kind of took a leap of faith there. But what if uh, HP or Dell or somebody else actually commoditized their hardware and had a similar strategy where there was other business model dynamics going on in IT. So with that premise, so the premise being that it's not so much about the margins on the hardware, it's just create a good hardware relevant product and have wrapped around services. What would they be? What kind of IT like services would you see uh, out there that would kind of bring that Apple model into Dell and HP's sweet spot? Right, well. Or IBM. Yeah, something that, um, that I, I, I think will happen over time and you know, it's always hard to, you know, to make a, a truly bold statement but I think there will be a day when you don't actually buy uh, server compute or even, or, even, or even desktop compute power anymore. I think there will come a day where you actually subscribe to it. And sometimes hardware may appear with it and sometimes it may not, but it'll have all the kind of characteristics that we see with the solid cloud infrastructure today. And that means things that are kept up to date automatically, the IT department doesn't need to worry about patches, doesn't need to worry about uh, security settings and fixes and things like that. And so to the extent that you just subscribe to it, and you pay a monthly service for what you're using or what you desire in terms of performance or features, I think that is a business model that, uh, that, that we'll see over time. And it does rely on the ability for, uh, again, for, the, uh, for these vendors to be able to uh, have capacity on demand and be, and be very elastic. And so in terms of a vendor like that, I think that's a possibility for them. I think they have to embrace the cloud more fully. I think you know, this uh, out innovating in hardware, I think, is, is a losing battle. Um, you know, Apple is unique in its, in its ability to so do that. So Apple's just going to take the market? No, I think, I think Apple, uh, who knows if their next rev, you know, revs of the hardware are going to be as interesting as their past mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. But I think what they've done is they create an ecosystem. You know, what's, what's valuable, is it your phone or is it the applications, right? It's the apps, right? Yeah. So I think... Yeah. You phone's know, great if, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if, if, if I think if the other vendors were to take a page out of, out of, out of Apple, it's, you know, you've got to create an ecosystem where developers uh, want to build on top, and I think you do that. Developers are spending their time in the cloud today, so the, the more that you can enable them through cloud platforms, the more you're going to, they're going to be building on your, your, your technology. It's basically the kind of the common sense, create value, and, and let, let everything take its course. Well, final couple questions I want to get uh, to you guys before at the break, and it's great to have you up here, um, is what surprised you this year in terms of, like, in a way that almost knocked you out of your chair, like, oh my God, I, I got hit over the head with that trend, or you know, that dynamic, was it, it could be an M&A deal, it could be, could be something else, could be a new trend, it could be the Facebook IPO. What, Frank, we'll start with you, what, what surprised you this year, uh, from last VMworld to this year? What's the big, uh, you know, aha? Yeah, so one of the things that did, uh, that did surprise me was the, uh, the I'll just say how, how much people underestimated Microsoft's ability to bring 
uh, a viable infrastructure as a service to market. So if you sat here a year ago, everyone would have just said, no way, it'll, it'll never happen. And I just see uh, an awful lot of uh, both ISVs, independent software vendors, and also business customers really looking at uh, Windows Azure as an alternative uh, to, as to other clouds. And I think, uh, maybe last year, I think uh, I was even less, uh, I was less bullish on that, and I've, I've been surprised. Okay, so let me add another part of the question so I can I get one more uh, piece from you. What surprised you from the investment as a VC, what surprised you? So two questions, the market trend surprise, and then as an investor, surprise. Right, so again, for me as, a, you know, from a, you know, as an investor, I think it's still just pace. Uh, the amount of deals that were done uh, you know, early, early and late uh, in the first half of this year. Uh, there's been an incredible thirst uh, from the venture community to, to place money into, uh, into enterprise deals. And uh, that pace is, is faster than I thought it would be. Again, sitting here a year ago, uh, we talked about the amount of enterprise quality VCs and it's, it's usually you know, paying an eye and about like eight other guys that we know and go to dinner with from time to time. And we just see more and more people come into, you know, to start investing in, uh, in enterprise. I think that the pace is something that, uh, that I was surprised by. King, probably the biggest market and the investment yeah, surprises? Yeah, I think uh, from a virtualization perspective, from VM world to VM world, uh, VDI actually has been a, an area that I've been pretty surprised. In terms of the growth and adoption of VDI, I just did not expect uh, to see that level of activity that I'm seeing. I think it's very exciting and encouraging. I think. Uh, Maybe it's the BYOD trends you're seeing in the enterprise that are driving some of the need for that technology, but I think that's, uh, that's exciting. Um, I think the other area that uh, has been interesting is just the appleization of IT, for lack of a better word, um, and how, how the Mac and the iOS platforms are really turning over the, 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 the landscape for uh, IT administrators and how, to, how they're grappling and leveraging those technologies I think are going to be incredibly interesting as well. The Appleization of IT, mobile, yeah. app stores, <laughs> it's yeah. happening. Service oriented stuff, self service, great stuff. Yeah. King Lee and Frank Gartelli, two amazing VCs I've gotten to know over the years, fantastic. Smart, making great moves, big deals. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, thanks for your perspective. And uh, we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Great. Thanks.